You know, we've just come off Thanksgiving for 2020. And if for a lot of people, that probably <laughs> is, is kind of a weird saying, a strange thing. Thanksgiving and 2020 put together. A lot of people might not think that that's, those two things go together really well because we've had such a weird year. It's been very difficult and very unnerving. It's kind of taken us out of our comfort zone, to say the least. And it's been scary at a lot of times. When we think back through the year, probably the first things that come to our mind are the thing, not things that we would be thankful for. But I'm going to tell you that in the middle of this year, God has been moving. I think about people who, maybe there's some of you out there that your life has been changed forever in a good way. You know, I think about a young couple that I baptized at the beast, beach earlier this summer. I think about two guys that we're going to baptize uh, next week, actually. Um, and, and it's going to be great, you know, and how God has been working in their lives. And I've enjoyed watching them grow and, and, and grasp um, who Christ is and start to see that do, do make a change in their life. You know, I think about, um, maybe you can remember about things that have happened for you over this past year, that, that things have been something that's changed in your life that you'll never forget. Maybe some of you got married this year. Maybe you met that special someone. Maybe you asked someone to marry you. Maybe you got that new job. Maybe um, you, um, you had, had a child this year, and you're just in awe. Or maybe you find out you're going to have a child. You know, I think about a couple that I married back in the first part of this year. And, and yeah, this year's been tough, you know, as for the pandemic and all those type of things. But they've started on a brand new journey, you know, that God has for them. So what I'd like to do right now is if you have it this weekend, even if you have, let's take one more, one more moment. And I want you to think about something this year where God has shown up. It might be something as small as when you were out to your last scrap of toilet paper. Somebody showed up with one or you saw some in a convenience store or something happened. It may be something as small as that. But I want you to think about something that God has done for you this year that you can be thankful about. Let's put away the trouble. Let's put away the, the health concerns and all of those things. And let's consider what has God done this year. And I want you to take this moment right now and just audibly say, Thank you, God for and tell him what you're thankful for and here's something i want to share with you as well god says to be thankful in all things in his word so i want you to thank god for what's coming now it may seem scary maybe there's some things in your personal life that's that's difficult that you're afraid that are coming maybe you don't like the holidays or the holidays are a tough time for you maybe you struggle with depression and holidays are difficult right now I want to assure, to assure you that God is here and God has you in mind. God has a plan for you wherever you are. You know, and I don't, if you, you out there, what I would like for you to do at this moment is to take a moment and thank God for what's coming. Because even if something comes that's difficult, even if something comes that's hard, God is going to do amazing things in your life through it. You can count on that because he loves and cares for you. So at this moment, I want you to say, thank you, God, for whatever's coming. I know that you will help me handle it. You know, my name is Jim Campbell. I'm the lead pastor here at Bay West Church, and we're here for a special day. I have a friend that I've been pouring into for years. That such a, I've enjoyed watching this young man grow over the past decade, and he's going to be sharing with us this morning. His name's Adam, and uh, he's got some amazing things to share with you from God's Word. I've already heard him preach it once, and it's amazing. I, I, I'm really excited for you to hear that because there's some amazing things and some incredible things that you can take away and put into your life today that will make it a different and better world for you. If you're not a part of a life group here at Bay West Church, I'd encourage you to be. Those are small groups that meet during the week. Uh, you can go to baywestchurch.com forward slash groups and click the sign up, find a group button there, and it gives a list of our groups. We have some that meet online, some that are in person. Um, you know, personally, I, right now I go to a family life group where we actually have our kids with us, you know, and it's a, we do that together. It's kind of an interesting concept. It's cool, you know, and so we take our, our elementary kid, um, Braden, with us, and we go and, and have, a, have a Bible study there and play some games and stuff like that. And it's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's good. It's, it's an interesting environment to learn in. 
Um, I want to tell you about something too for the next two Thursdays at Thursday at 9:30 to 11. Uh, we're uh, first two Thursdays in December. We're actually going to be having a special ladies Bible study. It's so easy to lose yourself in Christmas with all the craziness that's going on. But my wife's going to be teaching a study on the women of Christmas and helping us not lose ourselves in the Christmas story. But how do we find ourselves? in the middle of this season and not miss these moments and still um, work everything we do for the glory of God. You know, if you'd like to follow on with the sermon notes, you can do so. Just go to baywestchurch.com forward slash notes in a few minutes when Adam preaches. Uh, if you'd like to give, we make that opportunity for obedience available to you. You can do that at baywestchurch.com forward slash give. Or if you're a person that likes to write a check and mail it in, that's, that's totally okay too. Just make it to Bay West Church and mail it to 100 Emerson Drive, Northwest, Palm Bay, Florida, 32907. We actually do our meeting in per person at 1115 on Sundays. And if you feel safe to come out and you're in the area and are not plugged into another church, feel free to come and be a part of Bay West. You know, but right now I'm going to turn it over to Josue Gomez and our worship team, and they're going to lead us in some music. So I encourage you to put this on the biggest screen you have. You know, if you're watching on a phone, that's okay. Stick your headphones in. And as they sing and lead us in singing, sing this out to the Lord with all your heart and thank Him for everything that's going on in your life.
So one of my favorite scenes in any movie is a scene in The Empire Strikes Back where Luke goes to meet Yoda for the first time. And when he goes there, if you've never seen the movie, if you're one of the people that not a Star Wars person, you probably still know who Yoda is. You know, little green guy, wrinkly, big ears. You probably would even know his silhouette if you saw it on the screen with the bald head and the big floppy ears. So you kind of know who Yoda is. Star Wars is so ingrained in our culture, it's so part of our culture, that you know who Yoda is, you know who Darth Vader is, you know who Chewbacca is, you know what the Millennium Falcon is, probably. And so, but there was a time where you didn't know that. And when I, when I first saw these movies as a kid, and I loved them, I was probably 10 years old, and I was allowed to watch Star Wars for the first time, I didn't know who Yoda was. So when I, so when the expectations going into that, when Luke is told he has to go to this planet, he has to find this, this Jedi Master who's going to help him with his training. So your only knowledge point at that, at that point, is the other Jedi Master you've seen, which is Obi-Wan Kenobi. So I was thinking, we're going to get another Obi-Wan. He's going to be maybe a little younger. He's going to be a, b a better warrior. He's going to be able to help Luke train better. So that's the expectation I had going in. But when you get to this planet, and Luke gets there, and he crashes, he's all frustrated, and then this little green guy just comes out of nowhere and annoys the fire out of him. He starts stealing his food, banging on his stuff, making jokes, and you're like, who's this guy? And then you find out, well, this is Yoda? And Luke doesn't believe at first. He's like, Yoda, he tells Yoda, like, I'm looking for a great warrior. And in typical, typical Yoda response, I'm not going to try and do the impression because I'm bad at it, but Yoda says in his bad, broken up English, wars not make one great. And that just made me think, you know, sometimes our expectations of what something is are incorrect. Luke expected to find a great warrior who would teach him how to battle, who would, ha who would how to use a lightsaber, how to do all these things that he thought a Jedi master should know how to do. But in reality, Yoda was more of a philosophical teacher. He was going to teach him how to control himself, how to use the Force better. It, not what Luke expected. It's not what Luke expected out of someone who's supposed to be great. And that should be in our minds, too. When we think about greatness, when we think about what is greatness, what comes to our mind. Because in every single one of our minds, the word great comes with definitive expectations. We think of great political figures. We think of military people. We think of s people who fought for social justice. We think of people, sports figures. We think of the term for sports, the goat, like the greatest of all time. In basketball, who's the goat? In football, who's the goat? But is that really what greatness is? Is it a big geological feature? Is it like the Grand Canyon? The Grand Canyon is great. Mount McKinley is great. These huge things we can't even comprehend in, you know, in the universe, they're great. Maybe it brings behind a specific event in your life that was great, a specific person in your life who knowing them was great. Maybe it brings to mind a specific year in your life that was great. It's probably not this one, but maybe you're thinking, oh, that year in my life, that was great. And it brings up debates. Who's the greatest president of all time? Who's the worst president of all time? What makes our society great? What makes it not great? What is the greatest natural wonder in the world? Who is the greatest basketball player, football player, whatever? But are our definitions of great correct? And the passage I want to be looking at this morning, Jesus attempts to answer for the disciples and for us what greatness really is. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have a Bible app on your phone or a mobile device or whatever, we're going to read that passage. It's going to pop up on the screen. It said, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm 
to drink? And they said, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called to them, to him, and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over him. It shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the background of this passage is that Jesus is slowly making his way towards Jerusalem, where he's going to be, in just a few days, he's going to be tried, he's going to be executed, and he's going to raise from the dead. So he's on his way to Jerusalem, but in the meantime, before he gets there, he's using this time as an opportunity to continue to teach his disciples important things before he, before he leaves. And this is one of those passages, and it's kind of a weird passage because you just have this, this woman come out of nowhere and ask Jesus, my sons, who are James and John, say, can, when, you get, when you get to your glory in heaven, can they sit at your right hand and at your left? And it seems like something that's completely out of left field because, wait, that's like a, that seems like a big ask. And even Jesus says, like, you know, that's kind of something... He doesn't say no, but he basically tells them no. But if you actually go back to the previous chapter, the, Jesus actually tells the disciples that they're going to sit at places of honor, you know, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's not entirely a, out of left field, but it's almost like James and Don are trying to get bumped up from business class in the kingdom of heaven to first class. And it just, and it, of course, it makes the other disciples angry because probably because they, were, they wanted to ask the question first and they just didn't think of it. And so they're, kind of, they're, they're immediately jealous of these two guys saying, wait, how do you, no, you can't be asking that. Well, we, all, we are all in this together. So and it's, one of, it's also one of those times that when you read the Gospels, it's like that it makes you feel good about yourself that the disciples oftentimes didn't really get what Jesus was saying either. Jesus had said in pre, in just twice in the last two chapters, the first will be last, and the last will be first. But they glossed over that and remember, oh, well, Jesus said that we're going to sit on thrones, so maybe we can get even better thrones. They're trying to get more, trying to increase their, their status in the kingdom of heaven. But I want you to notice something in Jesus' response to them. Yes, they're asking for something ridiculous. Yes, they're asking Jesus for something that he really cannot give them. But oftentimes in Scripture, Jesus uses these opportunities where he's asked a ridiculous question, whether it be by the Pharisees or whatever, to make a point and teach his disciples and us something important. So I want to focus on those, on those last few verses, on verses 25 to 28, to try and glean what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples on what greatness really is. I'm just going to reread verses 25 to 28 real quick, and it says, but Jesus called to them and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever must be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and just give his life as a ransom for many. First thing I want, I want to kind of glean out of this is that Jesus is trying to point out to the disciples that serving under is greater than power over. Because greatness, the idea of greatness in the first century where Jesus was, is not that much different than our own. The word great in English is not that, is not that different than the word megas in Greek, which is which we, mean, we translate as great. It means something big, something large, something overwhelming. But Jesus is kind of saying, you know, that's the world's definition of great, but that's not mine. And he goes far, so far as to compare what, how the disciples were thinking with how 
It says the Lord of the Gentiles, we're thinking. Now, that really can only mean one thing in the context of the culture. He's talking about the Romans. So, but, so in many ways, he just insulted his disciples, saying, you know what, you're thinking the same way that the hated Romans who invaded Israel, who in many Jews' eyes were just blaspheming God by their very presence in Israel, and saying, you're thinking just like they're thinking. He, d- he doesn't compare them to the Jewish leaders. He compares them to the Gentile leaders. Because he's saying, you are thinking exactly the way they are. He's telling them their definition of greatness is no different than the worst people they can think of. That greatness is to have power over other people. That greatness is to be exalted over other people. That greatness is to be heard over other people. That greatness is to be respected over other people. To have influence over other people. To have more. To be more. Is that, in our lives, is that our definition of what it means to be great? Is that the way we think in our lives? Are the people that we let influence our, our lives simply the most powerful, the most successful from a worldly point of view, the richest, the most influential? Are we led, are we influenced by people who seek to serve and not seek to have power over others? The first thing that Jesus is trying to get is that to understand that greatness is not trying to be the most anything. It's by voluntarily becoming the least, to give of yourself. Like I said, twice in the last two chapters, Jesus has, to- has told his disciples the first will be last, and the last will be first. And, the, and we hear that, if we've been in church a lot, that we, we kind of lose how hard that hits. It's like saying up is down. It's like saying left is right. But Jesus is trying to turn their whole mindset around. James and John were trying to be first without understanding what it meant to be first. Even worse, at least for me, they were trying to do this by being manipulative. They were trying to manipulate the Son of God by using their mom. It's absolutely ridiculous saying, uh, Mom, uh, okay, go, go ask Jesus this question. Because they knew that Jesus wouldn't, they thought that, that Jesus would respond better to, to their mother than they would to them, which is probably a good indication why you shouldn't ask the question in the first place. And it, we, we laugh and we point, point at them saying, why do they do that? That's, but do we not honestly do that? Do we not honestly manipulate people? Do we not, you know, ask the boss how's how's the family how's life going not because we genuinely care or seek to help because we want a brown nose and get in on his good side do we not do little things for your spouses for your kids for your parents for our friends and think we're serving people but in reality, we're trying to get something out of the people that we love. That is a worldly way of doing things. When we talk to people, when we give them our opinions, when we do things for them, when we say the th- do we say things and do things that, make, that point them to Christ, that serve and build them up? Or do we do things and manipulate and move people around to serve our own interests to make us feel better. In all things, do we come alongside and serve people and push them up towards Christ in the way that we love them? Or do we push them in positions that better ourselves? One way is Christ's definition of greatness. The other is the world's. And this passage also demonstrates, I think pretty clearly, that humility is greater than pride. I'll tell you a little secret. God loves humility. I mean, God really loves humility. You don't even have to leave the book of Matthew to see this fact. Matthew 18, 3 through 4 says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself 
like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And more famously, Matthew 5, 5, out of the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, another word for humble, for they shall inherit the earth. The humble are great. The humble will inherit the earth. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And even though the word humble is nowhere used in this passage, I think it's pretty clear the intention of what Jesus is trying to convey. He calls those who wish to be great to be a servant. The word servant in this context is someone who does menial labor, who gets down, who gets dirty, with no regard for their own pride. He then goes on to say that even greater is, is someone who makes themselves a slave. And obviously, we know what the word slave means, what it conveys. It conveys someone who doesn't have control of their lives, whose entire life is wrapped around doing and serving, th- doing things and serving others. A slave has no control of where they eat, what they, where they sleep, where they live, anything. They live in total servitude of others' wants and needs, not their own. But the problem is, people are not naturally humble. And I think that's one of the things that most people understand is that they're probably not humble enough. If you were to generally ask people, do you think you are good at humility? Hopefully they would say no. Because as soon as you say yes, you've indicated that you don't understand what humility is. But we all know those people in our lives who people that I lovingly refer to as senior humble brag, who, people who toot their own horn whilst believing themselves to be humble. People who describe how bad their lives are going, how crappy everything is, but yet you, they tell you what's going on, and you compare your life to theirs, and you understand your life isn't that bad. You know, humility isn't simply because of our sin nature, it isn't natural. It is a supremely difficult thing to be humble. I read an article in preparation for this talking about how humility is not only countercultural, because if we looked at all famous people in our society, to politicians, to celebrities and sports figures, you wouldn't classify humility as one of the top things you would see among people who are famous. And, but not only is it countercultural, it's kind of counter-natural. I mean, philosophers throughout history and political scientists have, have talked about this. Karl Marx, who's the founder of the communist philosophy, hated Christianity because of this. He saw the call to be humble, the call to serve others before yourself, as a specific way for the masses of people to be controlled because they wouldn't serve their own self-interests and rise up and overthrow the government. Christianity was the enemy of the people because it told people that they had to be humble and they had to serve other people. It is more natural to be proud. It's more natural to seek your own good at the expense of others. But pride is a dangerous thing. Pride, in many ways, is the foundation of all sin. It was pride that caused Adam and Eve to fall because they thought they knew better than God. It was pride that that made the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years because they thought they knew better than God. When was the best time to go into the promised land? And when they were exiled from their homeland again, it was pride that that these other gods could serve them just as well as the God of their fathers. And they could depend on their allies in other countries more than they could depend on God. It was pride. It is pride that has started every war, caused every injustice, every genocide. Pride tells us that we are worth more than others, that we value ourselves more than we ought to. Not that we don't have value. Of course we have value. God came and he died for us. What more value could you have? God values each 
and every one of us so much he came to die. But it is God that provides our value for us. And when we try to provide our own value in ourselves, it always ends up in us putting ourselves before others. Humility is greater than pride because it is the humble that can truly see how valuable each and every life is. The, pri- the proud can only see what's in front of them. They can only see what they consume. They can only see what they can get. But the humble is described as a servant and a slave because a servant and a slave doesn't have enough to understand the only thing that's valuable is God and what God has done for them. That's why God calls them great. It should be pretty clear then what Jesus is trying to do here. He's trying to get the disciples to stop living with traditional understandings of greatness and instead look to him as their example. Why is it better to serve under people than to seek to have power over them? Because that was what Christ was doing. Why is it better to be humble rather than proud? Because that was what Christ was doing which leads to the ultimate sign of Christ-like greatness, which is that self-sacrifice is greater than serving self. If you reread verses 25 through 28, there's kind of a stepping stone of what Jesus describes as greatness. The servant is great because they give their time and their energy without pride for the sake of others. The slave is greater still because they give their very identity and their will for the sake of others. But the greatest of all is the one who gives of themselves, even to the point of death. It is a reiteration of John 15, 13, which says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Greatness then is not measured by how much you can get, how much power, how much influence, how much wealth, but it's a measure of how much you can give. And I just want to say this right off. No famous person that you can think of is great in the eye of, in the light of who Jesus is. Donald Trump is not great. Joe Biden isn't great. No sports figure, no president, no king, no queen, no scientist, no warrior, no social figure, no anything is great. But Jesus, Jesus is great. No one has been capable of giving up so much for so many. The creator of everything, from the mightiest of stars to the pieces of every single atom, took on human flesh of us, of dirty humans, like you and me, to live with us, to teach us, and ultimately to die for us so that we could truly know him to be in a relationship with him. He is the definition of greatness. And any flawed thing that we can do ourselves in the service of others in humility is great. But the question is, at least in, even in my mind, why? Why did I choose to talk about greatness? When all we see this year that in this light of this week makes us hopefully not less thankful, but potentially feel less thankful. The year that started off with massive wildfires in Australia and then leveled up to a global pandemic to social injustice to crazy election that seemed like it would never end to tropical storms it seems like every week somewhere why would i talk about greatness in a year where it seems like nothing has been great but i knew as soon as as soon as jim asked me or to fill in this week that this was going to be the passage. 
I had read it in a book. I mean, it was referenced in a book that I had been reading. And it kind of just stuck with me. But I didn't know why. And then it hit me in this past Sunday when I was struggling to piece any of this together. That I'd failed in this year of turmoil, turmoil to be great. I'd failed in my service of others. I'd failed in the desire to be humble, especially with all the differing opinions this year about every single thing. And I, everyone was divided on every single thing that I lacked humility. I was right about all of my opinions on all the divisive issues and everyone else was wrong. I had lacked humility, especially humility of heart. And I had failed this year being self-sacrificial. I didn't give of myself as much as I should have. And if many of us were honest, we would say the exact same thing. That possibly, like me, we've kind of used this year as an excuse to not be able to be serving others, to not be able to be humble, to not be able to be self-sacrificial, that the world outside is so crazy, that the people outside are so crazy that it's difficult to love them the way that we should have. And we, if we were honest, as believers, those of us who are believers, that maybe, just maybe, if the church had done better at what Jesus is trying to convey about greatness, about service, about humility, that maybe this year might not have been as bad as it has been. And it should convict us, and it should force us to our knees and ask God for forgiveness. But the good news is, there is grace. God understands, like he understands with the disciples, that sometimes we will fail in our understandings of the things that he says. And we will fail at reaching the goal that he has for us. You know, when I, when I, was, when I started to follow Jesus as a boy, I decided that I was going to have one spiritual goal. And it's a spiritual goal that has gotten me through times in my life where I've been paralyzed by sin. It's gotten me through times where I've stayed up awake at night, paralyzed by regrets, mistakes. The goal was this, that I'm going to be more like Christ tomorrow than I was today. That I'm going to be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. And that is the goal. Christ is the standard for greatness. It's a standard that we will never reach, but it is a standard nonetheless. And he will give us grace and mercy to be able to serve others. Because that's what greatness is, is to be able to give of yourself now, we're never going to be as great as Jesus because we have less to offer other people. That's just the truth. But what we do have in this challenging year that, that's coming to an end and in the year that's coming, let us be thankful for Christ that he has given us this grace and in return to, to greatly serve others the way that Christ has served us. And if you're out there and you're not a follower of Christ, I implore you to latch on to the only thing that is truly great. There's no politician out there that's going to save you. There's no social figure, there's no musician, there's no anybody that is truly great enough to bring value into your life. But Christ can. And he will if we but surrender to him. Wow, what an amazing message from Adam about how do we define greatness. It's so awesome the way that God sometimes he, the way we normally think things are, God has a totally different plan that works so much better. You know, as you go out into your life this week, I pray that you'll take that message of putting others first and serving others and having humility 
um, is being better than pride, you know, and, and serving under people, better than lording power over them. I pray that those things would be a part of your life as you move forward. And you see God work in amazing ways in your life this week. You know, once again, if you're not a part of a life group, now's a great time to be a part of that. Uh, if you, you can go and join a life group at baywestchurch.com forward slash groups. If you made a decision to follow Christ this morning, or if you would like prayer, or you have, have a prayer request that you would like uh, to give to our prayer team, we have a prayer team that prays throughout the week for the prayer requests that come in. You may have seen the little bug on the screen that says, you know, for, for prayer, text that number. You can text that number as well, or you can go to baywestchurch.com forward slash connect, and you can fill out a connection card there. And you can, if you made a decision for Christ, we would love to know that. Even if you're plugged into another church and you just happened to cross this video and you decided that, you know, that maybe following Christ is for you, you know, we would love to know that. Even if you don't come to Bay West Church, you know, if you are listening to this from another city or another state or out of the area and you're, I want to follow Christ and you don't have a connection with the church, please, baywestchurch.com forward slash connect and we will be more than happy, more than happy. I'll personally try to help you find a church in your area. You know, I've been in ministry a while, got some friends and connections and stuff. I'll do the best I can to help you find a great church because you need that in your life. You know, as always, you can give at baywestchurch.com forward slash give. We, um, but don't forget also coming up, ladies. This is ladies on Thursdays, the women of Christmas Bible study, the next two Thursdays, the first Thursdays in, um, in, in, in December. They'll be from 9.30 till 11. They're going to have a great time. We're going to be in our, our multi-purpose room where we have more room and can be socially distanced. Masks are just fine to wear. I've got mine, you know, because I won't be there, you know. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, because it's ladies only. But anyway, you can come out and feel free to come out and check that. If you, if you feel, I want to come, but I just don't know anybody, you know, text us at the number uh, on the screen. And we will hook you up with someone so that you can know someone and feel comfortable in coming because we'd love to have you here. So thank you so much for being a part today. And we will see you guys next week as we start a brand new series called Carols. Later. <laughs>